Okay, class. Uh, we'll continue our discussion about uh, dual problem duality. So we started with this problem of minimizing f of x such that x is in some set x and gx is less than equal to 0 and then we said guess what let us look at this map or look at this optimization problem as a geometric problem not as an optimization problem but as a geometric problem and what we get is we map it on gx versus f of x graph we define this set s s which is the set of g of x comma f of x x in capital x and then we said you know what let me plot a vector a hyperplane with normal mu comma 1 and mu is greater than or equal to 0 and as long as the entire set s is contained in the positive half space and this hyperplane almost touches the set s it's going to uh, intersect the y axis at in over x of lx comma mu okay and then this is something we understand and then we want to find our goal is to find x star our goal is to find the point at which the uh, the the minimum point of this particular function which satisfies this constraint set so instead of solving this problem we came up with another problem where we define q of mu as inf over l x comma mu x is in x so what is q of mu for every given mu mu is greater than or equal to 0 and mu is in r r so for every such mu we are drawing a hyperplane such that it's touching the set uh, it's touching the set s as well as s is in the positive half space and then this is my q of mu its y intercept is q of mu okay and so that's what we so we said that the dual problem so this is my primal problem the dual problem turns out to be i want to maximize q of mu such that mu is greater than or equal to 0 mu is in r of r and let's say the maximum value is q star the minimum value is f star here and the weak duality implied q star is less than or equal to f star okay so this is what we have done so far we looked at the optimization problem as a geometric problem and then we look at the y intercept of these hyperplanes the sequence of hyperplanes with different values of mu and then we arrived at this result that well q star which is the optimal uh, value of the dual problem is going to be less than or equal to f star which is the optimal value for the primal problem now let's see how we can use this idea in practice okay and I'm specifically talking about integer programming, but this idea is more general than merely integer programming. So I want to start with a picture. Let's say this is my set X, and I wanted to assume that there are no constraints, OK? Uh, let's say there are no constraints. I want to minimize the function over the set X. and someone came along and said let's partition the set x okay we'll partition it into x1 and x2 okay so what is the 
what do we have here? So x1 intersection x2 equals to null set and of course x1 union x2 is equal to the set x itself. Okay. I pick a point x1 here, well not x1, uh, I pick a point let's say x2 here and let's say I showed, so what I want to show, remember our, our goal is to find the optimal point, we want to find, we want to minimize f over this whole set, okay, and I pick a point x2 and what I can show is minimum of f of x, x in capital X1 is actually greater than equal to f of x2. Let's say I, I was able to show this result, okay, through some technique. What does that mean? What does this equation mean from a computational perspective? I want to minimize a function over a set. I partition the set into two separate sets, x1 and x2. And what I can show is that the minimum of function over this set x1 is actually greater than or equal to the function evaluated at some point x2 in this set. What does that mean? Sorry? Okay. So. So he's saying that we can do the minimization over x2, we don't even have to consider x1, right? That's something that everyone agrees with? Okay, proof by consensus. Okay, so what does this mean? This means, this means no loss of generality by solving minimum of f of x such that x is in x2. Wow, isn't that cool? Now what I can say is, I am going to, so now I have to con concentrate in this particular region. Let me do this, okay? Let me partition this x2 into x2, 1 and x2, 2, okay? and repeat the same procedure, okay, repeat the same procedure, okay, and as long as I can keep showing this result, what am I doing? I am reducing the size of the set over which I am performing the minimization, right, okay, so that's something that all of us understand. So this method in general is known as branch and bound, okay, so you first branch, branching means what? You're dividing the set into two subsets, smaller subsets, and then you are bounding it, okay, somehow you are bounding it, and if you are able to do that, then you can reduce the space over which you are finding a solution, okay. So what you are doing with the dual problem, find the lower band. Yeah, so that is what I am getting at, okay, but there was a question there. Branch and bound branch and bound, branch and bound, okay, that is the technique. Okay, so that is this technique, branching means dividing the set into two subset, subsets, smaller subsets, and then bounding means finding a bound on the minimum of fx and show that it is greater than or equal to some point chosen arbitrarily in the other set, okay? But how, but now the question is, you know, if the original problem was hard, it's quite likely that this problem is also hard, okay? So how do you solve it? Well, in order to find the, so I don't really want a minimum of fx. All I want to find is a lower bound to the minimum value of fx some lower bound, I don't care what that lower bound is, okay? So what I'm saying is 
if q star is less than equal to minimum of fx, x in capital X, q1 star and q1 star is greater than equal to f of x2, then also we are good, okay. We can always play this trick. So then we can play the trick okay is that clear yeah is that over the whole space x oh i'm sorry x1 x1 yeah yeah and x2 is in capital x2 So you start with a very large set, you do the first branching, you do the first bounding. If you are able to do this, that's good. You can proceed by branching off the second set itself, okay, and then again doing, playing the same trick. If it doesn't work, go back one step and change the way you have divided the set, okay. So let's say, let's say this was your first cut, first branching it didn't work out so next time you take the you take this branching if it doesn't work out the third time you take this branching okay so this will be your x1 and this will be your x2 okay and you keep playing this trick again and again again and again and eventually you will converge to the optimal solution so this is particularly useful in integer programming problem so let's see how we can use it in integer programming. Any question with this method before we jump on to integer programming? No? Okay. So let's look at an integer programming problem and see how you can apply it. Of course, I did not consider the constraints here, so you know the duality doesn't kick in until we have constraints. So let's put some constraints. I want to I want to solve this problem where x is equal to 0, 1 raised to n. Okay, so I have x1 to xn, all of them lie between 0 and 0, 1. So it can take binary variable, binary values. And let's say I define my x1 as 0, 0, 0 cross 0, 1 raised to n, no, n minus 3, okay? So I'm, I'm uh, assuming that x1, x2, x3, they have been fixed to be equal to 0, and rest of the terms can take values in, uh, in, two raise, in 0, 1 raised to n minus 3. So the dimensionality of this space is 2 raised to n. Those are the number of points. In this case, the number of points is 2 raised to n minus 3, right? So we have reduced the size of the space over which we are solving this problem. And x2 is everything, okay? Everything except x1, x2, x3 equals to 0, 0, 0. Now, what do I want to solve? I want to maximize mu greater than equal to 0, mu in RR, minimize x in x1, so that is my Q star, right? L of x comma mu, right? This is my Q of Q1 of mu. And I want to show what? that this q1 star, q1 star is greater than or equal to f of x2. So I pick some x2, so x2 is x minus x1, so I pick some x2 in x2 and then 
and then I have to show that this q1 star is greater than equal to the function evaluated at x2. But so how do we find this q1 star? Okay, that's the question. How do we find q1 star? So that's easy because you can write it as max mu greater than equal to zero c in R c such that L of x comma mu is greater than equal to c for all x in capital X1. Okay, so you have two raised to n minus three constraints. Okay, and then you have uh, a linear objective function. Okay, these these two problems are equivalent. Okay, these two problems are equivalent. Yeah. What is this Q1 star? So this is Q1 of mu, and I want to maximize over all mu greater than or equal to zero mu in RR, Q1 of mu. Yeah, that's the duality, right? So maximization of Q1 of mu, that's the dual problem. If you're restricting your attention to this set X1. Okay, so these two problems are equal. This is a linear problem with linear set of constraints. You can solve it. Okay, but of course the number of constraints are high. It's two raised to n minus three number of constraints. So by no means it's an easy problem to solve, but it's much easier than uh, trying to evaluate this point over all possible. Well, of course, this is n minus three, but typically you would have two raised to n over two. Okay, so you kind of reduce the space over which you are which you are trying to solve the problem. Okay, and then you try to find. So, so here is here is another another thing that you can you can do. All you want to do is prove that this Q1 star is greater than or equal to f of x2. So this is what you want to prove. So you evaluated f of x2, and you are trying to solve this problem. Let's say using a, uh, using a fine scaling or using a barrier method. As soon as you see that the approximation of the cost, uh, the value of the cost, while you are using a fine scaling or while you are using the uh, the barrier method, as soon as the cost goes above f of x2, you know that q1 star will always be above that, right? Because when you are running the linear programming, you are always trying to increase the cost. So you are taking a path so as to increase the value of q1, q1 of mu. Okay, so all you have to check is as soon as the approximate cost goes above f of x2, you are done. Okay, you can move on to restricting, restricting your attention only to the minimization problem over x2. So that's uh, that's really the key reason why uh, dual programming has become quite famous, is because when you have to solve integer programming problem. You can solve problems of this type, estimate the value of minimum of fx, okay, and q star, will, q1 star will give you a, a lower bound on the minimum value of f of x over x1, and then you can see whether you should turn your attention to some other set, or maybe change this set a little bit in order to come up with a different value of x1, different set x1 and x2 to run this trick again. Okay, so it's, it's an iterative process. It's going to take exponential amount of time. Okay, uh, but in practice, it seems to work the best. Okay, so you're able to get to the solution much faster. You just pick something randomly. Okay, something, yeah, x2 is a set. You can pick whatever number you want in X2. Uh, of course, in real problem, you have more intuition. I mean, if you have solved that problem for quite some time, you kind of have an intuition what should be 1, what should be 0. So you try to second guess what the solution would be. And then you use this method to check whether your solution, your guess was correct or not. Right? So one important application uh, that I'll just cover in words, I won't write it. Uh, is electricity market okay? So at 10 a.m., so 10 a.m. today, uh, every 
all the generators, nuclear generators, coal generators, gas generators, hydro, hydro power plant, all of them submitted bids to generate electricity, okay, and, and it's about uh, 2 p.m., so by now it's about four hours' time. In these four hours, they use this branch and bound method along with other Lagrangian relaxation methods. They use these methods to compute which generator will generate how much amount of electricity. Okay, it's a fairly involved, pro involved process. It takes a lot of time to run, okay, four hours. That's the usual time it takes for these algorithms to run and uh, give you a schedule of this generator is going to produce this much amount of electricity at this point of time. This generator will produce this much amount of electricity at this point of time and so on. Okay, so they schedule for the entire next day. So uh, for tomorrow, the optimization problem would have given a solution right now and this solution is posted and then all the generators know how much they are supposed to generate tomorrow. Okay, so that's how, uh, so that's, uh, that's really the real power of these branch and bound methods. Uh, and of course, you, you have a lot of people here who are looking at these kind of problems because they are doing research or because they are doing a project in this course. So you should definitely talk to them and see how they use these kind of methods to uh, solve these problems. It's a fairly involved and complex optimization problem. Okay, any question about branch and bound? No? Everyone understood everything? Mary? Okay. Okay, that's a lot of equations. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about the characterization of a primal and dual solution. So the first result is X star mu star is optimal primal and dual solution pair if and only if primal feasibility x star is in set x, g of x star is less than or equal to 0. And then we have dual feasibility mu star greater than or equal to 0. And then Lagrangian optimality is an argument of Lx mu star. And then we have complementary slackness. Okay, and I want you to note that this is complementary, so there is E here, not I. Okay, that complement is different. Complementary slackness.
okay so if you of course uh, you know duality is most uh, it's much easier to use duality if you knew there was no duality gap but uh, you know we have many problems where there is a duality gap nonetheless it is useful especially for the branch and bound method that we just said but let's say there is no duality gap there exists a dual uh, dual uh, optimal solution and uh, more importantly the dual optimal solution is also uh, um, since there is no duality gap it's also a geometric multiplier for the primal problem so if that is the case then how would you check whether x star mu star is an optimal primal dual solution pair or not well you go through these these equations so of course it should be feasible mu star should be greater than or equal to 0 x star should be minimizing the lagrangian evaluated at mu star and then complementary slackness condition should be satisfied now if you look at this particular equation you would feel like it looks almost similar to kkt condition right it doesn't look any different uh, except that in kkt condition instead of saying you have argmin all you say is the gradient of l with respect to x should be equal to 0 right that's what you say uh, but i want you to in your brain when you store this information when you store kkt condition and when you store this characterization of uh, uh, geometric multiplier and the optimal solution i want you to store these two theorems in separate boxes okay so you don't confuse between the between the two they are the two theorems would become the same if you knew there was no duality gap and if you knew that there exists a geometric multiplier for the original problem okay if that is the case then of course these two theorems would become the same okay but until you know that there is no duality gap these two are completely separate theorems okay they are not don't mix the two okay because in kkd condition this was lagrange multiplier in this particular theorem this is geometric multiplier okay it's very different it turns out that for convex problems they'll turn out to be same under certain conditions okay but in general they are completely different uh, objects so you shouldn't confuse between the two okay is that clear there's another characterization which is through saddle point so the theorem is x star mu star is optimal primal dual solution if and only if okay please note if and only if here okay that's important it's both sufficient and necessary x star lies in x mu star is greater than or equal to 0 and l x star mu is less than or equal to l x star mu star is less than or equal to l x mu star okay for all for all x and mu Uh, mu has to be greater than or equal to 0 so x in capital x mu greater than or equal to 0 now how should you visualize this theorem okay this result is hard to visualize it's just a bunch of equation this result on the other hand is very easy to visualize okay so let's let's try and look at the picture of what the lagrangian would look like if there exist a x star and mu star so let's say this is your space this was your x and this is your mu greater than or equal to 0 mu in r r okay what this is saying is if this is 
let's say this is your x star mu star pair so if i'm going along so if i if i'm at x star mu star okay if i'm sitting at this point if i go along the mu direction my cost is my lagrangian is going to reduce so it's going to look something like something like this but if i am going along x axis then my lagrangian is going to increase so that looks something like this okay and so that's what your l is going to look like that's that's how your l is going to look like uh okay this is your saddle point this is your saddle point this looks like a a saddle okay like <laughs> uh, how do i define a saddle well saddle is something that you put on a horse and then you do horse riding okay so it looks like a saddle uh, so it's increasing along x axis and it's reducing along mu axis okay and this is the optimal point this is the point x star mu star okay this is the saddle point okay and what this theorem is saying that x star mu star is the optimal primal dual solution if and only if it satisfies these constraints of obvious constraints and more importantly it's the saddle point so if you move along x direction the lagrangian increases if you move move along mu direction the lagrangian is going to decrease so from one direction you are at the peak but from the other direction you are at the valley okay anyone has done mountaineering before mountaineering no one okay yeah if and only if condition can you increase in x direction well you are increasing in x direction right no you can't well it's true it's true for sorry yes that is also a saddle point but that wouldn't be a solution to the minimization problem that would be the solution to the maximization problem okay if your constraints were gx greater than equal to 0 and your primal problem was max of fx such that gx is greater than equal to 0 then what you are saying would become the optimal primal and dual solution okay but not for this case okay so we always consider minimization of fx as that gx is less than equal to 0 that's the standard format for most optimization problem in which case this is how the saddle would saddle point would look like if you are done mountaineering you would go through a lot of saddle point but if you are not done so you should do it okay uh just tell your mom you're going on a educational trip and just go and visit uh, i don't know there's so many national parks here yellowstone okay it's it's the most beautiful place on this planet uh so you should visit there okay so that's the saddle point theorem uh all of these results are easy to uh prove um you should definitely consult the book if you're interested in the proof uh the important thing to note is you could have problems where f star so you can have convex problems where f star equals to plus infinity and q star equals to minus infinity okay so if your problem is ill defined you are trying to solve the primal problem you will go all the way to infinity and then then you say oh you know what my primal the algorithm that i have chosen for solving the primal problem is not working let's solve the dual problem and then when you start solving the dual problem you see that well the optimal solution is going to minus infinity okay so you can have those problems in which case you should know that your problem is not well defined okay you might have to add additional constraints or you might have to uh, remove some constraints so as to make sure that there exist a feasible solution that you can uh, that you can converge to by using one of one of the algorithms that we have studied in this class 
okay so this is something you should be worried about okay don't formulate a problem that's ill defined yeah right no it def it means that the problem is not well defined yeah you need more constraints yeah yeah so you know usually when you are solving a linear programming problem let's say your your constraint set is defined this way okay so everything everything in this part is part of the region part of the constraint satisfies all the constraints but then your cost gets minimized at infinity okay so let's say you are trying to solve minimum of x greater than equal to 0 minus 1 multiplied by x okay so this is an ill defined problem right so how do you how do you solve i mean so this is an ill defined problem because the solution is x equals infinity right so how do you how would you go ahead and solve this problem well you will come back and say you know what x cannot be x cannot take all the values from 0 to infinity in fact x should be less than or equal to 5 and suddenly the set becomes compact and you get a solution the duality gap in this case is infinite yeah that's but yes it, yes it can happen yeah right right well i'm not saying it's an ill-defined problem many a times you can have a problem that is well defined at least physically it makes complete sense but somehow there is a duality gap in the problem for whatever reason it may be right so this is all I'm saying is there exist examples where this kind of this kind of situation occurs, in which case Q star doesn't give you any idea about what F star would be. I mean, it still satisfies the fact that Q star is supposed to be less than or equal to F star. I mean, this is satisfied, right? But you have to probably put more structure onto the problem so as to come up with a meaningful solution. Okay. So, so far we haven't talked uh, anything about equality constraints, but here is how we can incorporate equality constraints within this framework. Any other question? Okay, so let's talk about equality constraint, which is a minor, uh, minor extension of what we have done so far. And everything that we have we have studied so far holds for equality constraint problem as well. I want to minimize f of x such that g x less than equals to zero, h x is equal to zero, x is an x. this problem is same as I want to minimize f of x such that g x less than equal to 0 h x less than equal to 0 and minus h x less than equal to 0 Okay, now I'm going to use mu to represent the geometric multiplier corresponding to G, lambda minus to represent the geometric multiplier corresponding to 
h x less than equal to 0, well let me make it lambda plus and then lambda minus that tells you the geometric multiply corresponding to negative of h x. Okay. What would my Lagrangian be? So mu has to be greater than equal to 0, lambda plus has to be greater than equal to 0, lambda minus has to be greater than equal to 0. So now my Lagrangian x mu lambda plus lambda minus that is equal to fx plus mu transpose gx plus lambda plus transpose hx plus lambda minus transpose hx with a negative sign. And I can write this as fx plus mu transpose gx plus lambda plus minus lambda minus transpose h of x. Okay. So what I have now is lambda plus which is a non-negative quantity, lambda minus which is a non-negative quantity, but you are subtracting two non-negative quantities which could lead to negative quantities. Okay, that's a lot of negative things in the same sentence. Okay, so this you will replace this by lambda, which can actually take value in R M. Okay. So remember we started with values that were greater than or equal to zero, but since there is a subtraction of two non-negative vectors, I can replace it by uh, any vector in Rm. Okay? And so what I have is L of x mu lambda, which is fx plus mu transpose gx plus lambda transpose h of x. And then I can go ahead and define my q as a function of mu and lambda as inf L of x mu lambda x in capital X and my dual problem, what would the dual be? I want to supreme, take supremum over q mu comma lambda mu greater than equal to 0, lambda in R m. Okay, so that is my dual problem for equality constraint. Yeah. That's a that's a very good point. You know, uh, suppose you wrote the problem in this fashion, and let's say you get lambda. Let's say lambda was in R two, and lambda one was equal to one, and lambda two was equal to minus one. Okay. Now, if you look at the equation, h one of x less than equal to zero, and h two of x minus h two of x less than equal to zero. If you had written the problem in the original form, well, let me write it in the original form. H1 of x less than or equal to 0 minus H1 of x less than or equal to 0, H2 of x less than or equal to 0 minus H2 of x less than or equal to 0. Okay, these are the four constraints. Since lambda 1 is equal to 1, this constraint is active, okay, but this constraint is not active. Well, of course, if this constraint is active, it means that my h1 of x is equal to 0, right? But
Okay. <laughs> you know uh, what is the what is the value of mu, right? If you think about sensitivity theorem, what it says is if you move the boundary along certain direction, your mu star is representing the rate of change of the optimal value. Okay. So what this is saying is if you move the boundary, okay, so you made minus h1 of x less than or equal to some small u, it's not really changing the optimal value of the function. Okay, but moving this boundary does change the optimal value of the function. Okay. No? Okay. So let's say you had this boundary and this is the optimal solution. Okay, so the constraint is active and this is your feasible feasible point. Now this so let's say you move the boundary to this this point and you still find that the optimal solution hasn't moved from this point. What does this mean that this constraint, even though it looks like an active constraint, wasn't really active? Because of the sensitivity theorem. I mean, because mu star was equal to zero corresponding to this constraint. Okay, so a similar thing is happening here. So even though this constraint is active and this is also active by the very nature, one of them is active, the other one is inactive in this sense. Okay, even though the point lies on the manifold on this surface, if you move the surface, the point may not move. Okay. Or rather the change in optimal cost would not and the, the optimal cost would not change. Okay, so what I'm saying is if you see lambda one is equal to one, what it means is lambda one plus is equal to one, well lambda one minus is equal to zero. And for lambda two lambda 2 plus is equal to 0 and lambda 2 minus is equal to 1. Okay, So this was active constraint and this was active constraint. And these two constraints even though they look like it's, they, are an act, they are active constraints, if you move the boundary the optimal cost is not going to change much. If you move these boundaries independently of these boundaries. okay. It's not, uh, try to think about it offline, okay, because we have three minutes. But what you will see is, uh, let me try to, let me give you some pointers so that you can think about it at home. Okay, this is your h1 of x less than equal to u1 and minus h1 of x less than equal to u2 okay so you have moved these two boundaries independently of each other what you will see is that instead of one vector one boundary you now have two separate boundaries and the solution seems to be independent of this boundary the solution seems to be moving in one direction instead of the other direction what that means is this boundary doesn't participate in the optimization problem okay so that's how you should think about these constraints and what lambda 1 plus and lambda 1 minus would look like. Any other question? Okay. So next class uh, we'll talk about, oh, we'll talk about convex uh, problems and duality. And we'll prove that there is no duality gap in certain class of convex problems, okay? Um, oh, by the way, I have one good news and one bad news, okay? The good news is, the good news is there is no class on November 13th and the bad news is there is no class on November 13th, okay? So the good and the bad depends on whether you want to come to the class or whether you don't want to come to the class, okay? <laughs> 2 is greater than or equal to the minimum value. So we fu I should find this. So it well, no. You actually can find this very easily uh -huh. just by picking a random x2. Uh -huh. 
but if you can find this, it's even better. Uh, yeah, because yeah, uh, it's the minimum of uh, every right. point in this right. set. Right, right. Okay. So any upper bound on the minimum value is completely okay. Okay, I see. And once we find this lower bound, so we the the same the I mean we can solve this uh, the left remaining part Correct. because uh, this part is a lower bound. Correct. Part, so we can Correct. keep doing Correct. It, Correct. decreasing. Correct. 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 So the, the idea is to reduce the set over which you are optimizing again and again, you know, in an iterative fashion. And the key issue, so, you know, finding a lower bound on the minimum value of x1 is easy. You can use the dual, dual program. But finding an upper bound on the minimum value of, a tight upper bound on the minimum value of fx for x in x2, that requires quite a bit of work. Right. So that's why in the class I presented f of x2, uh -huh. but in reality all you need is to find an upper bound on this part. Upper bound on this part. Okay, I see. Okay.